if you're concerned about something and you've got to stop business as usual, you have to have a really compelling reason to do something differently. It's funny how doubt is so difficult to erase. You know, trust, it, once it's gone, it, it, it's tough to get back. But you know, for most scientists, it's like, you know, hello, we've already done that problem. We've moved on. For me, the, the discussion then is, okay, how do, we, how do we talk about it in this new way so that people get it um, and, and it, we, we, we've moved the discussion further, right? It is, it's ultimately, it's just about an open and honest dialogue. And it's like, okay, how do we have the dialogue in a new way so that it, it's meaningful and it, it takes us further down the road? And I think in, in many respects, you, you've got to begin to talk about the here and now and, and give people something that they can really relate to. There's significant warming taking place in winters. And, and you know, it actually follows very nicely in the sense that as you go further up, in latitude, the warming becomes more pronounced. Obviously, heat waves are, are a huge, a huge discussion point. And heat waves, as opposed to hurricanes, um, are an area that we, we've got decent skill when it comes to modeling. Uh, temperature is just a much less tricky variable to model than something like precipitation. Let alone, I mean, a hurricane is about as complex in terms of the dynamics as it gets. But when it comes to, to temperature and heat wave modeling, we've got a pretty decent sense of how it is impacted by climate. What one group did um, in the UK was to look at this, you know, this phenomenal heat wave in 2003. It was based on the best estimates we had. It was the warmest, um, the warmest summer in Europe since at least 1500 AD, and records in Europe go back quite far. And they had supplemented it with paleo records. Temperatures in Paris topped 104 degrees, and we all know that there's a whole social dynamic um, in that in the sense that these are buildings that are predominantly brick and people don't have air conditioning. And so you know, the death toll of 35,000, which some people say is actually more like 50,000, is, is a very complicated mesh of things. You can't say you know, global warming was the cause of these, these deaths per se. But what they tried to look at was they tried to recreate, I mean, they, they did a very similar experiment in the sense they took the, the conditions of July of 2003 in Europe and then they ran modeling studies. And they said, okay, statistically, What's the chance of this heat wave happening in a no, you know, no additional CO2 world versus in the world that we live in today? And the statistics end up being very, very interesting, right? So what you can say when you do these attribution studies is, in respect to the European heat wave of 2003, that human influence at least doubled the chance of summers as hot as the one we saw in Europe in 2003. I mean, that's the best we can do. I mean, in terms of being able to pinpoint and blame something, that this is this is the language that, that we have to talk about. But it's it's all it's all risk assessment and all risk analysis basically, and it's changing statistics. And the models basically show there's a doubling of the risk. And then if you if you move those models out in time, what they tell you is that by 2040, the 2003 type summer that we saw in Europe will be happening every year. And how do you know for sure that it's us? And I think that's one of the questions I get most of all. So, you know, there's there's global climate models for this. Um, there's well, there's the observational data that, that Keeling collected and, and the climate monitoring monitoring stations collect in terms of temperature data. There's the paleo records. You know, there's all of these 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 data sets, um, both satellite derived observations and then paleo records. And then there's the models. So, the models kind of serve as additional proof. So, so there's the trend, roughly speaking. This is the trend in temperature that we see over the past century. The scientific community and the IPCC are now saying that by the year 2100, we could lose you know, 15 to 30% of species, water supply issues could become very constricted. You know, and, and it's not to say, it, it, the thing is we can talk about this rationally and realistically and not think of it as some end of the world scenario, but just to approach it. Um, and, and like I said, it's essentially an infrastructure problem these are some of the trajectories. These are like these potential futures. These are different pathways that we can choose to take. And it's like, okay, how do you, how do you, how do you begin to engage with a plot like this that, that becomes sort of difficult to internalize? Because these are different um, emissions pathways in terms of just fossil fuel burning, essentially. And what's interesting is that we're already, in terms of our emissions trajectory, we're already above the worst case scenario. So Scientific estimates say we've probably got enough wind in the world to power our energy needs you know, somewhere five to seven times over. So there's a ton of wind out there. Obviously, the big problem is transmitting it, right? And this, this graphic, I think, is really interesting because, and T. Boone Pickens talks about this a lot, you've got your wind corridor, right? So it's stretching from North Texas up to, uh, to North Dakota and Montana. 
massive wind. I mean, there's enough wind in that corridor to basically power the entire United States. So the reality, um, and this is what we kind of need to deal with in terms of energy infrastructure, is the fact that so blue is wind, red is population centers, and green is no wind. So basically you've got wind, you've got nothing, and then you've got population centers. So you need to connect the two. And this is where all of this discussion of energy infrastructure comes in. And it's, you know, it's, it's a really important discussion. And, and you know, I think if people could really see the potential, um, then you know, it, it wouldn't seem like such a huge hurdle to overcome.